Welcome, everybody. This is RISE Learning Machine Seminars, and I am Olof Mogen. RISE is Sweden's research institute with over 3,000 people working on a wide array of topics. The computer science department work on, works on uh, applied AI projects for the benefit of society, and we organize these weekly learning machines seminars. These are open to everyone. Uh, the seminars are recorded, as will this meeting be. And if anyone wants to be removed from this recording, just let us know. Also, do check out the collection of great talks that we have on, on our YouTube channel. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Stefan Bauer, who is an associate professor at TU Munich. Uh, Stefan obtained his PhD in computer science from ETH Zurich. Uh, where he previously studied mathematics and uh, and uh, he's also studied economics and finance at the University of London. Uh, he's previously been assistant professor at KTH in Stockholm and uh, he's been a group leader at Max Planck Institute for Intelligence Systems in Tübingen. The topic today is neural causal models and with that said I will stop my screen share and uh, hand over the words to you Stefan. Thanks a lot for the very kind introduction um, and for organizing these amazing uh, seminars. So now my screen should appear as uh, full screen. Um, if you have questions, please post them in the chat or, 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 or ask because I might not see a hand signal um, given that I focus on the slides. Um, and uh, I changed the title a little bit, but it will be the same content. So I changed the title on the road of cost structure in the age of um, large uh, pre-trained models in order to discuss the role both of causal structure learning and uh, the role of inductive biases um, um, in, in, in modern day uh, machine learning research. And um, my group uh, focuses um, both on causality as well as uh, representation learning. So for, ex uh, for example, we study the inclusion of interventional data, scaling of causal discovery or inductive biases for structured representations. And then we aim to apply the intersection of these methods to biomedical applications where questions like treatment effects, effect estimation or counterfactuals arise. And one particular topic we've been working on um, for quite some time is some form of causal representation learning. And what you see here is a robot um, lifting uh, a red cube. And um, on the right, you see a, a variety of downstream tasks. And imagine, for example, that you task the robot um, with lifting, um, with sorting the objects by color, then the position of the object and the color will matter, but size will, for example, not be important. While if you task the robot with sorting all objects by size, then size and location of the objects will matter, but color will be a nuisance factor. And so for a long time, we've studied, for example, how to include inductive biases to structure the latent spaces of these high dimensional images, such that factors like size, shape, or color would be represented in, in this latent space, and that you could build smaller models, which would adapt faster to different downstream tasks or be more robust to different nuisance factors. And um, this is, for example, including then the study of different inductive biases in order to structure these latent spaces. And nowadays, um, there's this different paradigm where you basically just pre-train on internet scale um, amounts of data. And one of the questions is, what is this role of these inductive biases to structure these latent spaces for these different downstream tasks? And how can we learn these causal representations or causal structure from, um, from these images? And how important and useful are these actually? And in order to give um, the talk, the structures um, and, and come hopefully to some form of conclusion, the structures the following. So in the beginning, I will give a brief introduction to causality because that topic, despite its um, large recent interest and despite the significant prices for Trudea Pearl or Guidin Imbems in the overall topic is still, um, I would argue, uh, um, uh, a small, only a small subset within machine learning. And then I will in particular talk about compositional generalization and experimental design as applications of causality um, in modern day research. So to give a quick primer about um, causality and causal structure learning, here we see um, the number, the, the amount of chocolate consumption in kilogram per capita on the x-axis versus the number of laure Nobel laureates on the y-axis. 
And what you can see here is that, for example, um, um, Sweden seems to be a very positive uh, positive outlier, and I would attribute that, for example, to this amazingly um, nice research atmosphere there, uh, which I experienced at, at KTH and at Rice, um, and which motivates me to 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 visit uh, you in person next time, hopefully. And then, for example, Swiss chocolate seems to be much much better than the German one, and overall there seems to be this strong linear correlation. And now the key question is basically, so what, how, um, what is the best prediction for the number of Nobel Prizes, um, given that we, for example, would set the chocolate consumption to 100 on the x-axis? So we really go out of the area where we have data and we intervene, and what would then be the number of expected Nobel Prizes? And on, on that scale, if, if I would ask you in person, basically, um, you could answer that there's no effect that the number of Nobel Prizes would increase or that it might potentially even go down. And uh, an, an, an alternative for answering this question is actually an interesting paper published in, in Nature, which was a survey about uh, asking Nobel Prize winners um, um, what they would say to answer this question. And actually, a lot of them attributed so uh, a lot of them attributed their success potentially even to the consumption of chocolate or mentioned that they would have, would they have known the fact then they might have um, consumed twice as much. Um, so this might be an interesting read. Um, another alternative nowadays is of course to ask ChatGPT and here's the answer from a previous version. So this was, I think, asked uh, sometime at the beginning of the year. And the answer is actually fairly, uh, is, is, is very polished and, and uh, surprisingly um, um, weighted, I would say. So basically the summary of this answer is that uh, typically winning a Nobel Prize requires years of dedicated research and deep understanding of the subject. And while chocolate may be a tasty treat, it is unlikely to have a significant impact on the complex work required to win a Nobel Prize. And you should rather rely, rather than rely on any food or beverage, um, you should uh, basically focus on developing your skills and knowledge. So this is a very well phrased um, sentence. And in the case of Nobel Prizes and chocolate consumption, we can probably use our domain knowledge tool, which is similarly here in, in the case of ChatGPT, that we assume that we can reason that there's a hidden confounder like the wealth of a country, which actually might influence our ability to invest in, in education and in, 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 in research, which might so influence our chances of winning this prize. And so in this simple setting here, we have this three different structures. So you could assume that chocolate consumption causes Nobel prizes, Nobel prizes cause the chocolate consumption, or that there's this joint hidden confounder. But from observational data alone, there's no possibility that you can answer that question alone. So you need to make an assumption in order to answer the question of where the Nobel Prize, the number of Nobel Prizes would be if you would set your chocolate consumption to 100. So you need some form of assumption, and this and, and all these assumptions would be equally at the beginning. So you could so basically, you cannot answer that question in, in the wrong way because you cannot verify either of the assumption of these underlying graphs. So all these graphs are given the data equally likely. And what are the key reasons why we are even interested in these graphs? Well, without making this causal assumption, the best you can do is actually say that you don't know the answer. So for example, if I would then ask you, uh, what is the number of Nobel prizes given that I would set the chocolate consumption to a hundred, and the best you can do without making a causal consumption is to say, I don't know, or I don't want to answer, or I cannot answer. But if you answer the question, you make one, one of these assumptions on this underlying structure. And once we've made this assumption of what is the relationship between these variables, we have typically three natural downstream tasks. So one is, for example, imputation of data. So we assume that the data has missing values, which are missing not at random, but by some form of, 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 of structure, um, which caused certain, certain data points to be missing. Another aspect is, is cause-effect estimation. And another natural downstream task for once you have the structure is something like experimental design. And in the following, I will talk a little bit more than in the second part of the talk about experimental design as a downstream task of learning this causal structure. Now, how, how difficult is actually the problem? So in the case of this example of chocolate consumption versus Nobel prices, we were in this, um, uh, we were in, in we, we, we had three potential um, uh, three potential graphs. And what you can see here is that with the number of nodes, the number of DAGs, and number of graphs actually grow super exponentially. 
So finding the right bag is an inherently hard problem because you would need to search over this number of, uh, over this discrete space of bags, which is growing super exponentially. And I don't even, I can't even pronounce the number here because it's such a, such a huge number, but already for three nodes, you would have 25 graphs. And um, this was indicated early on that you would, for example, from this uh, Greek philosopher who mentioned, I would rather discover one causal law than be the king of Persia. And so one of the questions is, for example, how can we search in this space efficiently? What are different methods? And for an overall introduction into this, um, into this um, different methods for causal structure learning, I would reference the ICML tutorial um, um, I gave us uh, Rosemary K last year. And in today's talk, I will more focus on the advantages of, of causal structure for the case of experimental design and for compositional generalization or the problems um, with our, um, which come with this compositional gener generalization. <laughs> now, how can we actually speed up this learning of these causal graphs in this um, super exponentially growing space? So either you can make restrictive assumptions on the functional form of the data. So you can, for example, say that they are linear relationships um, or um, or you can assume that there's interventional data. So here you would have this overall space um, of the X and depending on how many additional assumptions you make, you can basically sh shrink your search space. And these restrictive, um, these assumptions on this functional nature of, of the data. So for example, that there are only linear relationships or that the, ga that the noise is, is non-Gaussian are quite restrictive in practice. And you typically don't know if, if that is true. So here, for example, we focus a lot on interventional data. Um, um, because we, we believe that the biases this introduces or this verification is then um, easier to verify. And here, um, and, and, and that is why likewise um, experimental design is such an interesting use case for causal structure, structure learning. And another point, which I think I want to mention here, and which is um, uh, from a fairly recent interview with some of the superstars in causality in the published in the Journal of Observational Studies, is um, um, a quote from Jamie Robbins, um, which says that before you can pull a rabbit out of a hat, you have to put the rabbit in. And that is an interesting statement. And it comes from this last slide I showed. So either you can make this relatively restrictive assumptions on the functional form um, of the data generation process, or you can use interventional data. And the point is a little bit that if you make these assumptions from um, on this functional relationships and um, that this is kind of the magic which happens in this in this trick so this assumption is similarly to this rabbit you put uh, into the head before basically magically pulling it out and in one of these interviews he gives a very long and elaborate example in detail with equations that making this assumption can sometimes have basically um, unwanted effects effects that you already by making this assumption, force the result of the algorithm. Um, and this is something um, the, what he points out here. Um, I will explain how the, uh, the trick and show them how I use the general generalized faithfulness assumption to place the rabbit in the head. And that is why I think it's a little bit more interesting nowadays, especially where we have large wet, wet lab experiments possible, for example, in, 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 in biomedicine, um, that um, we focus a little bit more on the use of interventional data and the verification of causal structure learning using interventions rather than making these um, relatively strict um, and un often untestable assumptions on the functional form. And now, what is one setup where we can actually test it? And um, for this, I, 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 we actually um, searched for a very long time. And the best idea we would come up with is actually something like a Lego world. So what you see here is children playing with Lego blocks. And um, this is actually um, um, motivated a little bit by papers, especially from Alison Gopnik um, from, from Berkeley, um, which basically studied a lot how children learn causal relationships. And what is pointed out is, uh, as one of the takeaways, as one of the simplified takeaways of her, of her work is that they like us learn from intervening so that you basically grasp object, that you put them in your mouse, that you push them around. Um, is, is a key component for learning these relationships and that you do not just observe what your parents do, you actually try things out. And what these Lego blocks have, which is kind of a very nice uh, property is that given a set of uh, available objects, so which is just a few objects, right? That's like different colored blocks, different 
um, uh, different shapes of these blocks, but it's basically only the size, the color, um, which varies a little bit. So the number of different objects is not extremely huge, which we can see on this image, but that already given these few shapes, you basically have an infinitely large space which you can build. So you can build bridges, castles, houses, whatever basically your imagination comes up with. And despite this infinitely large search base, children manage to generalize quite well within this world by, for example, repurposing previously learned skills um, and transferring skills from one environment to the other. And this is something we try to replicate in a robotic setup. So what you see here is basically a three-fingered robot, um, which has a similar task of stacking these red cubes into a target shape, which is here presented green. And why is that needed? So it's partially needed because it gives you a parametric um, environment. So often it's quite hard to discern what is, for example, the shared underlying structure between, um, let's say, one Atari game or even the shared structure between two different Atari games. So what you can see here is that um, these environments in this causal world are defined as uh, by the generating variables like color, friction, mass, or gravity, and that you can then um, uh, intervene on any of these variables. So it's a really parametric space, and you can evaluate the generalization aspect, particularly with respect to that one variable that you see plotted on the right, when you, for example, just intervene on the goal poses. And surprisingly, this is an extremely hard um, problem and especially in an infinite uh, search base. So here you basically see which tasks we provided. So they go from extremely, from relatively simply, so simple from the description of the task, from placing an object red here towards a target location green, towards lifting a, a, a target location which is suspended in air, towards lift, lifting over a barrier, towards stacking, two different uh, red blocks towards a tower, towards building more complex 3D shapes, which might even be suspended in air with different numbers of blocks. So the search base, again, similarly to this Lego world, is, is very huge, despite the simplicity that you basically have only a couple of objects and the objects are always the same. And in order to move that um, towards more transferable uh, um, and, and to towards um, uh, uh, to move that actually to, to the real world, we, we likewise um, built this robot in the real world and not just in simulation. So what you see here is basically this robotic setup of consisting of multiple platforms where you could test the same approach, not just in simulation, but in the real world. So this is basically the three um, degree of freedom. Um, uh, so three degrees of freedom per thing, robot finger, um, which gives you a high flexibility in this arena. And these three fingers basically then need to move this, this object around and they are still available for submission. So if you're interested in trying something out on a real world robot, similarly to uh, submitting a job on a GPU cluster, you can basically submit to these robots. Um, so it's a very nice setup. And what do we do with these setups? Well, it allows you to, for example, study the effect of these inductive biases from, in, uh, for inducing structured representations with respect to OED generalization. So what you see here is basically the, a simplified setting where you have one robot finger who is uh, supposed to push um, uh, an object towards a target position. And then you can investigate how much your learned latent structure in this latent space helps you to generalize for different out of distribution settings. So what you do is basically you train an encoder on these um, on these data points and then a policy on top. And in order to enable a more efficient uh, learning, you basically free the encoder after the training. And then you can evaluate with respect to in-distribution where the colors um, you evaluate for moving an object towards a target location are basically used for training the encoder and the um, and the policy out of distribution where it's just trained um, on the encoder but not on the policy. Um, a second version of out of distribution um, where it's um, not trained on the encoder or then for not trained on the encoder or the policy and then for the real transfer um, where you basically have the color not trained on the encoder or the policy and you actually um, don't evaluate on a simulated setup but on the real robot. And so in these setups you can really test um, in a very systematic way how the effect of color and the effect of this learned latent structure um, affects your generalization capacity.
And it turns out that at least for these very simple settings where you only push one object, it's actually not that important that you induce a certain structure in, in the latent space. What is important that your latent space is of high quality, for example, as measured by uh, reconstruction loss or log likelihood, but how independent, for example, these factors are or how well structured the latent space is, um, is not important. And the reason is that in these simple settings and um, policy, like an MLP policy, is very efficient in um, disentangling an entangled latent space. Um, so with respect to sample efficiency, you don't see any benefit. Um, and this again raises the question, for example, should you really enforce training cost in compute for structure in your latent spaces? And one of the answers to that is it depends both on your inference cost and on your uh, training cost you have available and um, in the downstream task. So that significantly correlates with the complexity of your downstream task. And <clears throat> here's a slightly different setting. So what you see here is, is a more challenging task because it's not just one object, it's multiple objects. And on the right, you see what the task is. So basically you have a goal post, which is in, um, in green, and you have a, an object here in blue, which you need to move towards your target collection depicted in, in, in green. And you have something like distractors, which are here depicted in red. So you have objects in the arena, which are irrelevant, and where the number of these objects changes between different tasks. So it's not an adversarial perturbation because it, the object makes, for example, sense and pixel wise, it's actually a significant change. So for us, for example, here we see that the number of distractors changes from two to I think uh, seven, eight, like a, a much higher number. And this is actually an extremely hard problem already um, with attention-based models. So, um, and this is something we unfortunately experienced in, in our challenge as well. So we wanted to have the real op, the real robot place different shapes on the on the floor. So it was a, a, a 2D challenge. So you should take these cubes and place, for example, RRC on the floor or build these different letters, build different names or, or, or build a smiley, for example. And in order to do so, you basically need to generalize over the number of objects and the sizes you should you should build. And that is an extremely hard task. And right now, I don't see any approach which is able to solve that. And um, on the next slide, I actually want to motivate why that is such a hard problem. So here, we actually don't use, um, uh, we don't do anything from images. We use the ground truth features. So what you see here is basically that you have fixed size object tokens, which uh, describe you precisely the, let's say the location and these objects in this arena. So this is not from an image, but from the ground truth pose. And then you can um, develop and test the different object reasoning modules. And one of the most popular are, for example, graph attention-based architectures, where you train um, a graph neural network um, it should basically learn what to focus on and such that it would generalize if, for example, you change this number of distractors, which are here still depicted in red. And there are different architectures, let's say, for example, pairwise relation architectures where you don't try to learn a graph attention. You don't just try to let a graph neural network learn what to focus on, but you basically only encode the difference in the pairwise relations between each object. So, for example, between um, the target pose and one distractor between both of these distractors between the target and um, and uh, and your initial pose. And in the simplest case, you have something like linear pairwise relations where you only uh, encode the relationships between um, each object with the, with the goal, but not between each other. And um, these approaches have different complexities. So the attention, attention-based architectures um, as typical have this quadratic um, complexity. And what comes from this quadratic complexity is actually something which you can see here. Um, so the first plot in the middle is basically showing you with the number of distractors, how your uh, time steps in millions, so your comp computational complexity goes with respect to solving um, the task for a fixed number of distractors. And because of this quadratic cost, you can basically not do it for more than four distractors, no matter how much compute you have. 
that's already quite a significant result in the sense that we in, in this age of foundation models, what we would like to do is that you would basically, you could argue that you want to solve it for the largest number of distractors um, and hope that then you would be able to solve it for any smaller num number of objects. But because of the quadratic scaling, you will be unable to solve that for such a high number. You somehow need to have a better learning strategy or a better compositional generalization such that you can solve it from and generalize from the solving of a smaller task towards a higher number. And these relation networks are some form of inductive biases, which scales much better. So here, for example, you see um, some form of linear scaling, even with respect to the number of distractors. But what is more interesting is actually the generalization, which you see on the left and on the right. Um, if you change the number of interactor, distractors and the performance, which is here measured as structural su success, versus how it was trained and then evaluated. So here now, if we change the number of distractors between training and uh, testing. So you already assume that for a particular number of distractors, you are able to solve the task. And then in the test case, you just place an additional object into the arena, which has nothing to do with achieving this task. And what you see here is basically that each method for a fixed number, which is relatively small, you are able to um, to solve uh, to solve the task even with attention based me methods as as expected. But then, when you change the number of objects, you maybe generalize to one object more, but already your success is, is pretty much failing. Um, but for sure, you're not generalizing to two or more distractors placed additionally in the arena, despite the fact that they have nothing to do. With, um, with the underlying task. And that too is still a relatively small number compared to the fact that you could have hundreds of additional objects um, in, in this arena. And here you see that, for example, both for learning um, the relationships and for the performance and generalization, some of these inductive biases like relational networks are actually able to generalize to an infinite number, or at least here a double digit number, which is not shown anymore, but a significantly larger number of additional attractors um, versus these attention-based based models. And I think this is an interesting finding in a sense, um, or just a confirmation more or less, that with these attention-based models, we will most likely not be able to solve compositional tasks as we have in these um, robotic settings where you have then changing numbers of objects and varying numbers of objects and varying number of distractors in the evaluation, which I think is very realistic that this will actually change. And this is not, um, and this is something we actually experienced in the hard way. So as mentioned, we run this challenge, even the real world and the original task was that you train on, for example, placing these objects in this letter writing style and then get evaluated on a different number or uh, in different number of objects and different shapes. And so far, I actually don't know any approach which is able to solve that um, even remotely. And this is not something which is particularly new or not known. So here, for example, if you're interested in this compositional generalization, is a very interesting YouTube talk and paper about the face and fate and the limits of transformers on compositionality. And, and, and which I think likewise um, points out that current architectures just are not capable of this um, of this compositional generalization, which we assume would be a key for some form of intelligent systems. And um, so, yes, go ahead. Uh, so, so perhaps I missed something, but but can you give some insights on on how these relation networks uh, work? Yes. So, well, so not uh, not in. Uh, so the key point I think is on these um, on on this slide. So something for sure, um, uh, which is pointed out, is basically that. You discard a couple of of um, you discard a little bit of information. So, for example, when you have these linear pairwise relations, you really only focus on the relationships between your um, goal position and these objects, but not on these relationships between um, all the other objects. And that, of course, reduces your complexity in what you need to um, basically learn. And it focuses you a little bit that what only matters is basically the relationship towards your goal position. But that relationships already between different objects does 
does not matter. And that is, of course, a little bit of a specific use case then for the setting, because somehow we already know that this is the case, at least in, at least in the setting. And for further generalization, it might be required that you, for example, learn a higher, a larger structure underlying these problems. But what is true is that with this graph attention-based methods, um, you, you basically hope to learn too much. So this complexity of, of uh, in quadratic cost um, will not allow you to, for example, really scale the, these approaches, even if you have an industrial lab and the compute resources of an industrial lab are available. So it, it's, of course, like as a problem of the implementation that, for example, here um, it, it's based on a simulator and we were just an academic lab. But I think this argument that with quadratic cost um, and even better simulators. So even if you use some um, GPU-based Uchoku version, which hopefully comes out um, and not a CPU-based, you would be able to scale more. I think the underlying problem that you can't scale these, these approaches to much higher dimension remains, remains valid. And that indeed you need to focus on learning something from the smaller scale problems in order to, to generalize to these larger ones. There are likewise approaches which show some benefit in this direction from even for causal structure learning. So for example, from Rosemary Kay or Lars Lorch from, from ETH, there are these armatized causal discovery methods, which train transformer-based models and attention-based models um, on learning and discovering this causal structure. Um, but I think this so far was not yet, not yet implemented. And one form of this inductive uh, was not yet implemented on these compositional problems. And one form of these inductive biases, like these relation networks, which basically tell you that only pairwise relationships matter or even linear relationships matter, are very well suited for these tasks. So even these pairwise relationship architectures were used so far in, in, in visual question answering and visual reasoning tasks. Um, so this is a slightly related problem. So you basically are, try to answer questions about the scene, but this was not yet combined with, for example, manipulation skills. So I think this overall question, how to go for this, um, how to the, how to go for this compositional settings um, is a little bit unanswered what the best architecture is for that. I think that is an open problem. So I wouldn't say that pairwise relationship architectures are already the answer for that. But what we see from question answering um, so, so far and, and from these manipulation skills is that it's at least a very interesting direction to look into because it offers you um, a better scaling and potentially um, possibility to actually um, solve these tasks in, in higher dimension with purely with attention-based models seems fairly challenging. Does that roughly answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so this is the TED talk. And now, so now I would like to switch a little bit. Um, so robotics was the, the best test case or test cars, test task we could come up with in order to basically have a setup where we can generate large amounts of data um, have a highly uh, non-trivial problem to solve um, and have still full control over the overall setup. And nowadays, there are additional very interesting questions in biology where they perform lots of interventions. And as mentioned at the very beginning, lots of interventions basically limit your search space, make that much smaller, such that you should be able to um, actually discover the underlying causal structure. And one form of these, um, of these data sets and, and interesting problems is um, inferring the underlying network of perturbational data sets and, and single cell data sets in biology. So what you basically do there is you use, um, you use something like CRISPR, for example, to perturb the genes and then measure the effect with respect to a transcriptome. And this you can do nowadays in, in large scale experiments. So for example, you can do genome-wide knockouts and then observe these effects. And this is something we got very interested in the, in the, in the past year and um, in the past years. And one of the arguments here again is that you are interested in this underlying causal structure in order to explore the space of perturbational experiments more efficiently. Because the space is so huge that at least if you would then go, for example, for double knockouts or triple knockouts, you need some form of compositional generalization because you will never be able to search that space 
um, exhaustively. It's just too huge. And there's, even if you combine all the lab equipment in the world, you will never be able to search exhaustively. So you need some form of, general, of, of generalization and you need some form of understanding of cause of, uh, of an effect in order to say where you should explore next. And this is something um, which is very related to this uh, classical framework of, of experimental design that, for example, you want to build counterfactual estimators in order to generate different hypotheses. Then you want to run these experiments and use that experimental data in order to improve your, improve your estimators and generate different hypotheses where to explore and basically have this iterative learning loop. And why causality should help in this case is basically um, because you have a bit, you should have, hopefully, depending on your learned model, a better understanding of cause and effect. Um, and one of the most popular frameworks for this experimental design problem is Bayesian optimal experimental design. But that requires some form of Bayesian model over your, over your structures. And there are three different popular ways to learn um, Bayesian models um, over causal graphs. One, the first one is, is a frequentist method, which is basically um, subsampling the data, um, running a frequentist method multiple times of the subsamples, and then aggregating, aggregating this effect. Another one is classical Markov chain Monte Carlo. And the third one is some form of uh, variational approximation. And there are, in recent years, there are many more papers in these directions, and um, uh, it needs to be pointed out that learning a Bayesian distribution of graphs is mu a much, or posterior over graph structures, is a much harder problem than just learning an individual um, and inferring an individual uh, graph. Um, so these methods typically don't scale as well as, as just learning an one graph, and already for the one graph, this was a super exponentially growing search space. And so what is the problem in Bayesian optimal experimental design with, for causal discovery? Basically, you want to optimize the intervention gain, the, the information gain over your outcomes and latent causes given some experiments where you intervened. So for example, the, the, the node and the value and some data you already have. And you want to choose the intervention where to intervene and the intervention value, like this, how much you should intervene over these graph structures in some form of, of, um, of loop in, um, in, in order to converge to this underlying structure. And both the question, again, here for learning the where to intervene, as well as with which value to intervene, is, is fairly hard, especially because it in, involves maximizing the mutual information, which is a fairly um, hard optimization problem and cannot be done. So here, what you see basically is the mutual information for the simple graph on simulated data, where you would plot the mutual information for different um, intervention values. And what you see here that, for example, for uh, the simulated case, you would intervene here with a value uh, at a value of five, because it would maximize the mutual information across all these nodes and across all values of these no nodes. And in order to do that in practice, you can, for example, run some form of Bayesian optimization over like n Bayesian optimization over each of these um, nodes across all of these values. And then this becomes computational challenging, but at least you can do that. But here, the technical detail is, I think, less, less important than what is the result. So one of these results on simulated data is that um, depending on the number of samples, you actually convert to the scrum rules. Um, but that already on simulated data, for example, here up to 50 dimensions, these at the beginning, these curves look fairly similar and it's a little bit hard to discern and say if, if these methods are, are really much better. And this is on, on simulated data on, on relatively simple settings. And if you use semi-synthetic data, this becomes even harder. So all these, all these graphs are relatively overlapping, at least if you take uh, some form of um, uh, of uncertainty into account. Um, and, and this becomes even harder if you move to real-world data. So similarly to this challenge in robotics, we hosted a, a, a challenge on discovering and, and performing experimental design in, in truck discovery. And so there were different tasks and the, and the data were, were these perturbational data sets from single cell genomics. And, and we asked the participants, what is the next best intervention to solve this task? 
And the outcome was a little bit mixed. And I wanted to give one, one explanation for that. So what we asked for were, were um, are batched experiments. So you don't just need to um, choose the next experiment, but you actually need to choose, let's say, the next 10 experiments, which is a little bit of a harder problem. Um, because your, your, the choice of your next 10 experiments um, is somehow dependent. And what you see here is one of these uh, Bayesian methods um, for uh, batched experimental design on um, extended MNIST, which is a relatively simple data set, um, what you see on the right. So it has these numbers and, and um, numbers and, and letters in different forms and shapes. And what you show here is that depending on the acquired data set, you improve with your accuracy. And even, and this batch bold is to some extent, the uh, state-of-the-art method for uh, for this batched number of experiments, and what you see here is that even for this relatively simple case of of extended MNIST data, you basically see that it's quite difficult to separate these curves for um, between random, which is just you choose all the experiments random, and some form of optim optimized experimental design setup. And this is for a relatively simple data set. And now what you see on the right is basically something similar. So it's not the accuracy, but the mean squared error for different acquisition functions for a number of samples for these perturbational data sets I mentioned at the beginning. So what you see here is that basically it's nearly impossible to discern which method is actually better than the other one. And this is not a hand-picked plot. It's really that hard on, on these data sets. And why is that important? One motivation, which um, I think is super interesting, is that um, these data sets are up and coming. So you, there's already interesting medical papers, for example, machine learning for perturbational single cell omics, which summarizes some of these data sets, which have large scale perturbations. So thousands of, of, of perturbations um, with single cell recordings from different tissues or from different cell lines. And what you want to aim for and understand is some underlying causal model or underlying structure, which basically informs you about the next, next um, decisions in order to basically identify what is, for example, the difference between healthy tissue and tissues from cancer patients such that you can design interventions and perturbations which potentially um, shift your disease state towards the healthy state. And um, I think in order to make that future happen, we really need to develop more methods in this experimental design area. Um, we need to develop more methods um, um, to efficiently search these spaces and especially develop methods which are significantly different from random, um, which is parallelizable and relatively um, efficient compared to current state-of-the-art methods. And this is already the, the first summary. I have a couple of more slides afterwards that um, from the transfer from the first part about um, uh, the robotic setup and these, and these um, compositional generalization, what we found is that you are actually fairly able to transfer from the simulation to the real world, even zero shot without domain randomization if your simulator is well tuned. Um, but that this transfer does not, for example, depend on the structure you learned um, and the generally uh, and the inductive biases with which you induce these structures is less important, at least for simple problems. That it's more important that the representation is is of high quality, as for example measured in reconstruction loss, and that at least for simple problems. Um, it comes back to this bitter lesson that you can often achieve the same performance as structured approaches, um, but that you might potentially need exponentially more compute or data. Um, but in some cases, like simple problems, you get lucky. But for these harder problems, which really require compositional generalization, then it might be that these attention-based methods we currently have are actually insufficient and we should really develop new methods um, which perform much better. And the second part of the talk was about experimental design, where random is a surprisingly competitive strategy, at least for biomedical data sets. It might be different if you have a much higher signal to noise ratio, for example. And we are, for experimental design, just searching right now on fully observed systems. So it's not from high dimensional inputs like the images, um, uh, but from um, Excel sheets, 
or tabular data, basically, and that especially test beds are missing, for example, efficient simulators to advance these methods. And if you're working on anything like representation learning or quality of representations or experimental design and are interested in co collaboration, please, please reach out to us. Um, and so here I wanted to basically wrap up something which I think is, is both um, um, pessimistic and, and optimistic. So I started the talk with what was causality and how we can change and evaluate the effect of interventions with the question, what would be the number of expected Nobel prizes if you intervene far on the right? And at least with domain knowledge um, or even with ChatGPT, we are fairly able to answer the question on the left. Um, but likewise, because we precisely know what the variables are, we should enter, for example, into Google or which we should provide to ChatGPT. And here, for example, is a much harder problem. I admittedly haven't tested it with Gemini or some form of multimodal language model. But here, this example of cause and effect is much harder even for humans uh, to understand, at least if we, if we are very young. So here you have a person cleaning basically a room. It's, of course, a basically motivated image. Um, they are very popular on TikTok that uh, you have this uh, lifting the TV and the cyclists on the TV are basically then pushed, uh, pushed to the right. And here it's already much harder to basically say, what would you actually enter into Google if you would search for an answer, if that is a correct cause and effect relationship? Like would you search for TV, would you, like the, the, the variables and entities and abstractions or representations you would enter are not well defined compared to the left, where you basically clearly ask for the correlation between the variables Nobel Prize and the variable chocolate consumption. And this is actually a fairly hard problem. Like here, we can use again our visual domain knowledge to debug the cases, and we've seen that often enough. But it's quite easy to imagine that if you have, for example, such a readout from a cell, like a visual readout from a cell, discerning these cause effect relationships will be fairly, fairly hard and challenging, um, no matter what the foundation model was trained on. And something, so this is the last slide, um, I wanted to say why this is actually hopeful is that in this age of foundation models, we, we have, for example, here something like prior knowledge, um, which we can use and which is essential to be more performative than random. So what we did in one project was experimental design to find new INVA alloys and where we tried likewise to have some form of representation learning encoded. So what you see here is basically some already existing data set for infra alloys, which are alloys which do not expand in volume if you heat or cool that. And these alloys are very important for the next um, uh, generate for the next um, for this um, change in 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 the underlying e economics we currently have. So for example, we would want to switch to a hydrogen economy where we would need containers, which for example don't shrink in volume if we fill them with hydrogen or empty them. Um, and so what you see here is an active learning pipeline where you do some form of latent space sampling, but in order to um, uh, sample and send something for experimental validation, we use DFT calculations and large scale simulations in order to verify if these candidates are actually interesting candidates or not so interesting candidates. And why this is important is that with these simulations, we were able to basically efficiently discover a couple of new inbar alloys, forge them in the real world, and verify that these have at least have um, um, an extremely low thermal coefficient of expansion, and that these compositions weren't known before. And what is interesting here, I think, is that in this case, we were able to beat the random exploration um, um, quite well. And the reason was that uh, these um, simulations were available. And similarly to the simulations, you could argue that large language models are, for example, large scale memory systems or information retrieval systems, where you can use the higher or bias of these large language models to inform your sampling. And in that way, you can speed up your discovery process, which might be much more efficient than just exploring randomly. And I think that is an interesting inductive bias for some of these experimental design problems to work on in the future. And I hope that this will actually transfer to a couple of other applications and not just in VAR. And with that, yeah, I finally close. Here's again my email address. I'm super happy to work on the efficient use of interventions, experimental design, or especially benchmarks and simulations for um, adaptation speed, efficient data acquisition, or gen compositional generalization, as well as the impact of interventions on representation learning. And with that, I would be open for your questions, um, be it here in, in the Zoom talk or by email. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you, Stefan.
and uh, please bring up all your questions. Um, I'm really uh, interested in this active learning uh, experimental setup uh, uh, view. Uh, and in the the last slide, you you sort of that, that's 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 sort of an, a lab setting, right? Yes, uh, it's this is not simulations, but you actually actually do the these the chemical experiments in the in the active learning loop. Yes, so um, this was actually so you basically proposed new compositions or alloys, and then they were actually forged in in the real world. So it's yeah. not just that you discovered something in 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 simulation; you actually like forge them and test them in the real world. Amazing. Um, and, and this, of course, requires uh, collaborators, and and um, and I think that that is super interesting as an AI for for science application. Um, if material science is the best use case, I'm 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 not sure, just because um, um, experiments are quite costly, or the scale of experiments might be might be limited. Um, so something, for example, which might be easier as a readout is, let's say, antibiotic resistance, because I think. That is a clear signal for drug discovery that if something is, for example, has an, a resistance to was an antibiotic or, or not, um, compared to, for example, the thermal coefficient of expansion, you actually need to heat and cool it and measure these things, which is a little bit more of a complex problem. So I think for the key next application rounds, um, what, what is a fairly important component is how easy and clean is your signal you read out here, the thermal coefficient of expansion was a very clean readout because you have a quantitative measure for that. But I think there must be applications where this readout is clean and clear as well, but you mm -hmm. can perform many more experiments. Um, like here, this this was still a little bit limited um, given the cost of experimentation. In, in this setting, the, the acquisition uh, criterion or the ranking policy here, is does that take into account sort of different uh, sort of uh, the different aspects of, of the experimentation or the the, the, the sort of the, the entities making the annotations uh, or is it just ranking with regards to to what will give the the best uh, sort of best next step in the in the learning yeah so this uh, ranking is basically just there what will give the next best results and already there you could argue that you only do that because the amount of experiments you can perform is limited. Like in the best case, you wouldn't, you would just, um, you would ex explore with many more experiments, maybe not exhaustively, because then you don't need this whole active learning pipeline, but at least that it would be a little bit cheaper to perform experiments um, rather than having a handful of iterations. Um, and that was why we were, for example, so interested in this perturbational single cell data sets, because they're a set of hundreds of experiments is seems to be feasible, or even thousands of experiments seems to be feasible. While in this material science application, it was fairly fairly limited, so you had to do some form of ranking in order to select the most promising ten candidates for experimental validation, because each round you could only do at most three new compositions. Right. So we have a, a raised hand from Leif. Yeah, thank you. Super interesting topic and very, yeah, very interesting stuff. So first, uh, well, I have a, a, a couple of questions. I guess first, um, I was wondering about, I mean, listening to uh, Judea Pearl, <laughs> you kind of get the impression that he states that you, you absolutely cannot learn uh, DAGs from observational data only. Is, is that actually proven or is that just a hypothesis or what's the state of theory there? Yeah, do you know? So, um, the, 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 so yes, um, so this statement is basically here the same. So here you only have observational data and just from this data alone, you cannot differentiate between which of these tags actually created it. Yeah, and I was that is, that is true. More, more generic, let's say I have an infinite amount of just observational data. Like here, here I guess we have quite limited data. Let's say we have an abundance of data. Yeah. Uh, what is the kind of is that does it still hold then or yes even with infinite data so the key problem is basically that you have this potential hidden confounder and unless you have data let's say on this hidden confounder it's 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 impossible mm -hmm. 
Mm, okay. No so matter how much. Clear, then, that we need some type of intervention or something to do this. We cannot just do it from observational data. Yes. Yeah. So some. Uh, this is basically this uh, slide. So either you need interventions or you need to make an assumption. So for example, in the above case, if you would um, make an assumption of linearity in this relationship in Gaussian noise, you would already be able to do that from observations. And, and in some applications, you might know that. But yeah, I, I would agree that without interventions, it's 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 impossible. In, in in general, without making assumption. Yeah. I'm sorry, I had to mute you, Leif. There was some some weird uh, feedback loop there. Uh, were you happy with the question, with the answer? Yeah, very happy. Uh, I'm happy to have some more questions, but I let other people jump in between. If no one else, I'll jump in again then. So um, we know this uh, um, causal structure learning is, is a very hard problem. Uh, and I was thinking causal structure learning at its core, is that about learning a causal DAG? Or is there something more than just the DAG? I mean, I'm thinking about time series, for instance, or those kind of things. Or is the DAG all we need? Yeah, that, I think that is a, a good question too. So um, it's it's indeed a super hard problem. And so far, I think mostly we've, so there is structure learning for time series and there's a different, uh, like there are various applications. So far, I think we haven't done that enough. Um, and the reason is that it was already challenging to learn DAGs up to this dimension. Like 10 dimensional is an unbelievably large search space. And we didn't have, you could consider 10 dimensions already basically large scale in causal discovery. Like I think you could make an argument for that given this number of, 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 of potential DAGs. Um, and only nowadays by, by scaling some of these approaches, we are able to, for example, use some of these models to learn um, DAGs up to 50, 100, or even a 1,000 uh, variables. Um, and now, given that you can learn these, I think um, potentially there are more, more applications now coming for causal discovery. So far, indeed, for causal discovery, it was a little bit limited with respect to the success, what we've actually learned in practical applications. And one inductive bias, I think, is indeed key is some form of, of time series and longitudinal sampling. So, for example, if you have um, not only observational data from the hospital, but, for example, the same patient coming in over time. And because right now, due to data anonymization, we have, for example, always only the patient coming in um, with, a, for example, not the same ID. And then it's hard to make this link and, and see it um, 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 as, a, as a learning signal. But, for example, for videos, or for uh, from time series, we know that this actually improves your learning, um, and this is quite essential for learning causal structure. Um, in fact, I think it's it's even quite hard to define causality without some form of time. Um, so, so we know that time series or videos might be quite essential to help in this learning process. But for example, right now, I don't know any method which can learn your causal DAG from a video. Yeah, super interesting. And, and uh, of course, in, in the DAG, we say it's acyclic. Uh, but some people say, well, maybe we, we, in some real world phenomenon, we actually have cycles. What's your view on that? And what's, how, what does causality mean in, in that context where it's actually not acyclic? Yes, so that, that's another good point. I, I think the typical assumption is indeed always that it's acyclic. There are a couple of methods which assume um, or are able to handle cycles. So this has been a subfield of the, of the community. It's indeed, I think, a practical limitation um, in the sense that this makes it, for example, hard to combine causality with something like reinforcement learning beyond imitation learning. So for imitation learning, we have some good understanding how imitation learning and causality um, 
um, can be combined or what's the causal perspective on that. But in general, with reinforcement learning, we then run into feedback loops, which would destroy this um, this acyclicity assumption. And then most of the frameworks or, or um, approaches are difficult to combine in, in these settings. And given that it's so hard to really combine reinforcement learning with, with causal frameworks um, as we have them, it, it seems indeed that there's some part of the framework still missing. There are some interesting approaches. So for example, um, equilibrium models are an interesting direction, I think, to explore um, for describing cyclic models. And, and there have been a couple of recent papers, for example, from Matthias Durton from, from TUM, um, or there have been even UNIF trying approaches for trying to reconcile um, cyclic models with um, more, more classic causal discovery papers in, in some form of reviews. Um, from from Jonas Peters, for example. So I think this is an ongoing field, but I would agree that for many practical applications, this this is indeed a problem because we have these feedback loops in in real world scenarios, um, and and that seems just quite difficult to to model this with these frameworks. Great. So I think it's uh, it's time to thank the speaker. Thank you very much, Stefan, for this talk and this um, discussion. Um, next week, welcome back. December 14th, we'll have uh, Fredrik Gustafsson from Karolinska Institutet in Stockholm. Uh, he'll be talking about uncertainty quantification in regression models uh, under real world distributional shifts. Uh, so welcome back and thank you very much for today. Thanks a lot for the invite. It was a pleasure. I reach out once I'm again in Stockholm. Sounds great. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.